We often say that the national question is the most complicated of questions that Marxists have to answer. And I would say that's not far from the truth. And I'd say it's also true to say that without a correct approach to the national question in 1917, the Bolsheviks would have failed to take power. This is how important this question is. And the national question has to be dealt with uh, very, very concretely. It, it, it's intimately tied to the question of consciousness, which can obviously uh, shift and transform in very unexpected uh, ways. No two nations are exactly the same. They all have their own peculiarities, their own uh, histories and, and, so, and so on. And a nation can be both an oppressed nation and an oppressor nation at the, at the same time. And uh, it can go from one to the other quite, uh, quite quickly as well. And also, national questions that were thought to have been resolved for decades, and even centuries in fact, um, can actually explode onto the scene and dominate politics. And Marxists need to be able to respond to these uh, movements in real time. We can see this all around us. Since the crisis of 2008, a number of national questions have flared up. Places like uh, Scotland, Catalonia, um, Quebec, Kashmir, Ireland, Kurdistan, Ukraine, Belgium, and so on. And what we can see is that under the pressure of events, consciousness is being dredged up enormously. All sorts of new political movements and formations are being thrown up, not just national movements, but you know, things like Sanders, you know, Corbyn and Syriza on the one hand, Trump, Le Pen and Maloney on the other. Uh, you know, it's the same underlying processes that are giving rise to these shifts in consciousness, which are all also giving rise to, uh, to national movements uh, as well. This is all ultimately a product of the impasse of the capitalist system. But I think the best place to start would be to answer the question, what is a nation? Because there is a great deal of confusion on this score. And it is actually quite a complicated question to answer, I would say. Now, first of all, I'd like to ask, did anyone um, here study politics at university? Wow, there's a lot of people. Yeah, God bless your souls. Uh, <laughs> I did so too, and I learned absolutely nothing. When I was in university, uh, I was told to read a, a book about the national question by an academic uh, uh, called Benedict Anderson. He had this book called Imagined Communities, which is about uh, the national question. I think the title itself really gives you all you need to know, right? His idea is that ba basically nations are essentially just made up, right? They're just a product of, of national myths, cultural practices, and of course, shaped by political discourse. Uh, you know, it's very postmodern and and idealist, of course, it can't really teach us anything. And this isn't really a new thing either. Even as far back as the Second International, after the death of Marx and Engels, there was an Austrian Marxist called Otto Bauer who put forward essentially the same idea that you know nations are essentially just you know sort of uh, you know ideas, basically cult cultural kind of uh, phenomena, not really tied to any sort of economic basis in, in in reality. So if you want to see a proper materialist explanation of what a nation is. Who shall we turn to in the year of our law 2024? Anyone? <laughs> 2024, the year of Lenin, exactly. Thanks, Bogdan. Lenin, basing himself upon the writings of Marx and Engels, he understood nations as historically evolved and determined. And of course, they have certain shared characteristics, things like language, uh, territory, economy, and so on. Uh, but we're not interested in a rigid criteria of these things. You know, nations can come into existence quite unexpectedly uh, when they didn't exist before. You need to have a very strong grasp of the dialectical method, I think, to really understand what a nation is. And for Lenin, nationhood is rooted, actually, in the emergence of capitalist society and the, the era of the bourgeois revolutions, the bourgeois democratic revolutions. Let's remember that nations, as we understand them today, didn't always exist before bourgeois society. In fact, under feudalism, you know, one's primary loyalty was, uh, was not to your nation, but in fact to your local noble or to your local city-state or something like that. Politics and power was extremely local, in fact, and extremely localized. There may have been a vague sense of nationhood, but it certainly didn't play a determining factor in, uh, in political life. And just like every aspect of bourgeois society, nationhood really developed within the bosom of, of feudalism. Um, in England, for example, we see this uh, under the period of Henry VII and Henry VIII, who began the task of actually unifying and centralizing the state and raising the monarchy above the local nobility. But it was when the bourgeoisie themselves were on the ascendancy when national consciousness really began to emerge as part and parcel of bourgeois revolutionary movements. And among other tasks which involved tearing down feudalism, these movements sought to, to clear away the mess of city-states, principalities and petty fiefdoms that characterized the feudal period and replaced them with nation states. And in the case of, for example, the, uh, the Dutch revolt and the American revolution against uh, British colonialism, this also meant throwing off national oppressors as well. 
Now, why did this happen? Well, in his work, The Right of Nations to Self-Determination, Lenin said that the economic foundation for national movements is the need for the bourgeoisie to capture home markets and assure the final victory of uh, commodity production. So put simply, the nation state is the best political unit for capitalism to grow and to develop. By getting rid of the, the mess of different taxes and currencies and measurements and so on that characterize the feudal period, this allows production, the means of production uh, and, of, and trade as well, to expand seamlessly. And Lenin also understood that language is, is central to nationhood as well, as of course it's, it's central to all human interaction. Language is the key thing that links the buyer to the seller. And therefore, it's the most rational thing to form an economic and political community around. Although, of course, there are exceptions to this, uh, as with all things. And yeah, things like shared myths and, and national stories and culture and so on, they do play a role, but ultimately they come after the foundation of, of, of national movements and nation states. So what we see is in the period of, of capitalism's ascendancy, sort of lasting from the 17th century up until the early 20th century, we see the creation of more or less uh, you know, rationally constituted democratic uh, nation states with a common language, common markets, uh, and, and so on. And this triumph over feudal particularism was indeed a historically progressive step as it allowed for the development of the productive forces. However, Lenin also points out that things completely change in the era of imperialism, which is obviously the highest stage of capitalism and also its descending phase of development uh, as well. Here we can see the productive forces outgrow the, the straitjacket of the nation state. And this actually gives rise to the wholesale plunder of uh, the colonies, for example, wars of annexation, uh, and so on. This obviously culminated in World War I in Lenin's time, but this same process is going on today at an even uh, accelerated pace, I would say. Uh, and the imperialist powers consciously hold back the development of nation states as they developed back in the sort of uh, the earlier period of capitalism with England and France and so on. They actually consciously hold entire peoples in conditions of, of semi-feudalism, of backwardness and colonial sla slavery. And when these oppressed peoples are stirred into action, it inevitably expresses itself in the form of national movements, at least in Lenin's time, of course. And we saw a whole wave of, of national movements shake the world. For example, in the 1910s, you had uh, national movements in China, in, uh, in, in modern-day Iran, uh, Turkey, uh, the Balkans, of course, all across Eastern Europe as well. As well as, obviously, you know, a few decades later in the 1940s and the post-war period as well, which I'll get onto a bit later. Now, what positions did communists take towards these national movements uh, at the time? Well, from very early on, Lenin and the Bolsheviks held a very firm and principled position on the national question. Lenin's starting point was the complete unity of the working class, of the proletariat, which of course is an international class which must fight collectively. You know, way back to the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels said that the workers have no country. We're not interested uh, as a class in, uh, uh, ourselves in you know, founding nation states. But nonetheless, the working class of oppressor nations has a duty to stand for the full freedom and the right of self-determination for all oppressed nations. And this must include support indeed for every revolt against colonialism and imperialism, even up until uh, you know, uh, the support for a revolutionary war against colonialism, for example. And this isn't out of some sort of like vague sense of you know, solidarity or like love of humanity or anything like that. It's for precisely their own interests as a class. And communists must uphold uh, the right to self-determination as it educates the working class in the spirit of anti-imperialism and anti-chauvinism as well. And on this question, actually, Lenin quotes uh, Marx when he was writing on the Irish question, which, of course, dominated uh, politics in, in, in Marx's time. And Marx said in a letter to Engels, I believe, it is in the direct and absolute interests of the English working class to get rid of their present connection with Ireland. He even went so far to say as uh, the, the English working class will never accomplish anything before it has gotten rid of Ireland. Now, why did he say this? Because Ireland was a tool used by the British ruling class to hold back the, uh, the, the, the English working class in particular. The oppression of the Irish gave the English workers, first of all, a sense of superiority uh, and privilege, which divided the workers' movement. It also provided the English ruling class with a, a source of cheap, exploitable labor, often, you know, for example, used as strike breakers, as well as a perfect scapegoat as well, a way of deflecting blame away from the system and cutting across the class struggle. Marx also understood that Ireland was the stronghold of landlordism in England and that a blow against landlordism in Ireland would weaken the British ruling class materially and politically. And therefore, Marx attached a, a great deal of, uh, of importance to the Irish question within the British uh, um, labor movement. 
Now, Lenin, I think, is a really good quote, which I think sums up the Leninist approach towards the national question. He said that the bourgeois nationalism of oppressed nations has a general democratic content that is directed against oppression, and it is that content that we support unconditionally. So this means that communists, yes, they have a duty to utilize all national movements which weaken the system of imperialism, not in words, but also in deeds as well. And yeah, from the very beginning, the Bolsheviks therefore adopted the right of nations to self-determination up until secession, by the way, which means breaking away from uh, the country that they're formerly part of as part of their uh, party program. And this was a doubly important question in the Russian Empire, which was, of course, as Lenin said, the prison house of nations. You had uh, Poles, uh, um, Letts, uh, Estonians, Finns, Ukrainians, Georgians, and literally dozens of other oppressed nationalities within the boundaries of the, uh, the Tsarist state. However, not everyone in the Marxist movement initially agreed with Lenin and the Bolsheviks on this question. Some of them took a bit of an ultra-left position, people like uh, Rosa Luxemburg and the Polish Marxists, in fact. Um, they said that in the era of imperialism, uh, capitalism has long outgrown uh, the nation state, it's long out overstepped the barriers of the nation state, and by supporting national movements, you're essentially, or by, even by upholding the right of self-determination, you're essentially trying to turn back the wheel of history. But they said that, in essence, uh, secession is, is utopian because national equality is impossible on the basis of imperialism and under socialism the national question would basically be irrelevant. Now it's understandable why the Polish Marxists would say this. In Poland the Marxists had to vie for influence with reactionary petty bourgeois nationalists, people like Joseph Pilsudski, uh, and in combating this nationalism they had a tendency to bend the stick too far in the other uh, direction. But there is a point in what they're saying of course the creation of bigger, centralized, unified nation states is ultimately progressive in general. You know, Marxists are, in general, in favor of greater economic and political centralization. This is the ABCs of Marxism. But there are other letters in the alphabet that follow after ABC, of course. Unfortunately, the class struggle isn't just a simple struggle between the international bourgeoisie on one side and the international proletariat on the other. National consciousness and national aspirations are a fact. When the millions of uh, peasants and petty bourgeois and uh, colonial slaves are shaken into political action for the first time, this usually always expresses itself in the form of a national movement. And communists must be extremely sensitive uh, to this mood while of course upholding an independent class position. Now Lenin said on the right of self-determination, he said, in the same way that mankind can only arrive at the abolition of classes through a transitional period of the, of the dictatorship of the oppressed class, it can arrive at the inevitable integration of nations only through a complete emancipation of all oppressed nations, i.e. their freedom to secede. And the Bolsheviks did this in practice as well. One of the first decrees of the Soviet government was the decree on nationalities. And this meant that the Bolsheviks allowed, for example, the Finnish to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to basically secede from, the, uh, from the, the Soviet state, from the workers' state, even on a capitalist basis, in fact. And the reason why they did this is because upholding the right of nations to self-determination, it fosters unity between the working class of oppressor nations and those of oppressed nations. It proves that the workers aren't interested in upholding oppression. It undoes the distrust, suspicion, and division that is often sowed by the bourgeois nationalists on both sides in order for them to uphold their respective national privileges. It effectively cuts the ground from underneath the nationalists. And what's more, national equality and democratic nation states do provide the best terrain for the class struggle to take place. By removing external oppression, this allows uh, class consciousness to develop along much clearer lines. Um, but what we can see is that upholding the right of nations to self-determination, which can include you know, the right to use their own language, the right of self-governance and autonomy and so on, and of course the right to secede, actually strengthens the voluntary economic and social uh, ties between nations. It actually acts to prevent the disintegration of, uh, of, of these big states. Paradoxically, it actually yeah, prevents it. That's exactly what happened in the Soviet Union as well, of course. By giving the freedom of these nations to choose, a lot of them actually chose to remain within the worker state and to share in the fruits of the economic uh, plan and so on. However, this does not mean that communists always and in every case support you know, national movements and the secession of nations. In fact, in an ideal world, we would of course prefer unity and amalgamation. Um, but we support the right for those nations to secede, which is very different. Just like how supporting the right to divorce is very different to you know, us supporting divorce in each and every case. 
Um, and yeah, in fact, in some cases, communists might even uphold the right of self-determination while actively propagandizing and agitating in favor of voluntary unity. And that is exactly what the Bolsheviks did, for example, in Ukraine in, in, in 1918. This is also the kind of position that Marx advanced with respect to Ireland as well. He said the most immediate task was breaking the British imperialist hold on Ireland, but on the basis of the working class taking power, a federation of the British Isles would of course be preferable. So the point is, it's not our job to arbitrarily decree ahead of time what the nation states of the future may look like under, under socialism. This will, of course, be decided in the course of the class struggle. And of course, once we establish socialism, national boundaries will begin to look a lot more different. I think things will be a lot more diffuse, actually, in that sense. As the state withers away, so will nation states as well, of course. Uh, and I think this is actually very relevant to our position on Israel and Palestine right now, in fact, because what you see is a lot of the left groups arguing and bickering over exactly what things are going to look like when the, you know, uh, in, in the future and so on. And I'm not really interested in this sort of utopian uh, speculation. Our main task right now is to remove the national oppression of the Palestinians and to remove capitalism from the wider uh, Middle East region. How exactly that will look in the future is a matter for the masses of that region to decide and not for us to speculate. Um, now, when it comes to the, uh, the national question, the tasks of communists are entirely negative and not positive. This is something that Lenin insists upon, in fact, and I'll explain what this means. Our slogans and our tactics are directed against national privilege and national oppression. But let's not forget that while the world is divided very clearly into oppressed and oppressor nations, there are many examples of nations that are both oppressed and oppressors as well. I mean, to go back to Poland, for example, right? Under the Tsar, Poland was clearly oppressed by the great Russian uh, nation, but also the Poles, in turn, oppressed other nationalities, like, for example, the Jews. Um, and as well as that, an oppressed nation, having gained independence, can quickly become an oppressor nation uh, to others. For example, after India gained independence from Britain, the ruling class in India, the capitalist class, immediately began oppressing other nationalities, like the Kashmiris, which is still relevant today, of course. Or, for example, uh, after Bulgaria uh, gained independence from Turkey back in the 1910s, they immediately began waging a predatory war of annexation against Serbia and, and Greece. And how can it be otherwise on the basis of capitalism, right? National bourgeoisies will always seek to expand into new markets and new territories if they're given the chance. The bourgeoisie is rapacious and self-serving by, na uh, by nature. And therefore, communists even when they are backing a national movement of an oppressed nation, they must be on guard against any expression of national privilege, anything that oversteps that boundary between uh, you know, the negative tasks and the positive tasks of, you know, kind of uh, um, you know, asserting national interests over others. I hope that makes sense. So when we back national movements, we do so with our own program, our own methods, and for our own reasons, the interests of the proletarian uh, class struggle. And for that reason as well, we also want nothing to do with any sort of slogans in favor of the positive development of, of national culture, for example. Now, some members of the Second International, like Otto Bauer that I mentioned earlier, they put forward this idea of national cultural autonomy, which I haven't really got time to go into, but Lenin does write about this quite a lot. And this idea basically meant that each national group, no matter where they live within a given sort of, uh, you know, within a given state, ought to have their own schools, their own cultural institutions, their own public services, their own taxes, and even their own like parliaments, for example. And this was nothing but uh, essentially a concession to petty bourgeois uh, nationalism. And in fact, I think we see a similar thing from certain groups today who really sort of fetishize the idea of, you know, Welsh devolvement, Scottish de uh, devolution, and even like Cornish national culture as well. Uh, while, you know, ironically, not being in favor of uh, these nations' rights to, right to self-determination. Um, so through all of this, you know, we, we remain internationalists. And Lenin said on this score that the world's working class movement is daily creating and daily developing an international culture of democracy and socialism. So our task as communists is precisely to develop this international culture, unlike groups who talk about, for example, progressive patriotism or kind of dissolving themselves into national movements uh, and so on. And this also actually involves the advanced communist workers of oppressed nations um, to advocate for unity with the working class of oppressor nations. So it works both ways as well. For example, with respect to the oppressed nations of Russia, Lenin said, for example, that the Ukrainian Marxists must snatch at every opportunity for interaction uh, with the Russian class-conscious worker, his literature and his ideas, for example. 
He also said that the Ukrainian worker cannot afford to translate a particle of hatred towards the Russian masses, lest he gets bogged down in bourgeois nationalism. I think this is really important, actually, because this is the complete opposite view put forward by, for example, you know, third worldists and uh, you know, post-colonialists and so on, who actually say that the working class in the imperialist countries are privileged and therefore have an interest in upholding national oppression. Lenin had the complete opposite view of this, uh, as a matter of fact. And from this perspective, actually, we can see that voluntary cultural assimilation and interchanging of ideas and so on is undoubtedly a historically progressive thing because it unites and uh, unifies the working class. And the last point in this question that I want to make before we move on is that while we are fully in favor of upholding the right of nations self-determination generally, this does not apply within the revolutionary party itself, nor does it apply within the workers' movement either. Lenin fought for the maximum unity within the Russian uh, Social Democratic Labour Party, which was the precursor to the Bolsheviks. He envisioned a strictly centralized uh, organization that was united through voluntary class discipline across lines of nationality, language, ethnicity, uh, and so on. He actually, from the start, opposed the separatist tendencies of groups like the, uh, the Jewish Bund, for example, who sought a separate organization for Jewish workers within uh, the Russian Empire. Lenin understood that this can only actually foster disunity and suspicion, and it gets in the way of the only natural groupings that should exist within the workers' movement, which of course are political ones. And instead, actually, the Russian workers' movement united all of the communists in the oppressed nations of the Russian Empire, who of course were fighting the same Russian ruling class and had to therefore work together despite maybe different conditions. So far, I've only dealt with the, the um, Lenin and the Bolsheviks position before 1917. But of course, a lot has changed uh, since then. In fact, we can see that the Bolsheviks position on the national question does change in quite an important way in the years following the 1917 revolution. On the basis of experience and on the basis of a, a, a radically changed uh, world situation. Now, one document that I'd recommend all comrades read is Lenin's uh, draft theses on the national and colonial questions. It's quite short, and it's actually published in the, uh, the IDOM, the one on, uh, on Africa. And this was discussed at the Second Congress of the Communist International. But what I want to note beforehand, actually, is that up until 1917, Lenin still believed that it was possible to have a successful bourgeois democratic revolution in a lot of countries, and that the bourgeoisie could play perhaps a limited a progressive role in, for example, former colonial countries. Um, and, you know, with this general perspective, which wasn't completely incorrect, Lenin believed that the, uh, the national question could be uh, solved on a capitalist basis. Um, and when you read Lenin's writings uh, on the national question from this period, you need to keep this context in mind, because the experience of 1917 actually blew that old perspective out of the water. You know, having arrived too late on the scene of history, the Russian bourgeoisie was so weak and spineless and so tied up with British and French imperialism that a period of capitalist development uh, was out of the question, basically. The bourgeoisie could no longer play a progressive historical uh, role. And Lenin realized, therefore, that the immediate task in Russia was for the working class to take power, to establish a dictatorship of the proletariat with the peasantry supporting them. And this would mean immediately beginning the task of building socialism, which of course uh, involves spreading the revolution internationally. In essence, Lenin went over to, uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks went over to Trotsky's position of permanent revolution, which said that the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution and the socialist revolution were now fused uh, together basically. And they both must be carried out by uh, the working class, no matter how small it was as a section of the population within any given particular uh, country. And this has huge implications for the national question. Because if the national bourgeoisie of uh, Russia, for example, was too weak and tied up with foreign imperialism to play an independent role, that is even more so the case in the, in the, in the colonial countries, for example. Therefore, in the, in the theses that Lenin wrote, he said quite clearly, the Communist International declared that the world political situation has now placed the dictatorship of the proletariat on the order of the day. And that therefore, the only salvation for the oppressed nationalities lies in the Soviet system's victory over world imperialism. This is very important because this is tantamount to saying that under imperialism, um, the national question cannot be adequately resolved on the basis of capitalism. And it can also not be solved without an international revolution, without international socialism. That's quite a dramatic change actually in Lenin's position, I would say.
In fact, it was in this period that Lenin began to use the term national revolutionary instead of bourgeois democratic in order to really uh, underscore the fact that um, you know, the national question was now intimately tied up with the question of socialism and that these national liberation movements couldn't really proceed on the basis of, uh, of capitalism. And on the back of this perspective, the common turn said that the communists in oppressed and colonial nations must fight to place themselves at the head of national liberation struggles by putting forward uh, a working class program of international socialist revolution. And they must, of course, give energetic assistance to any bourgeois democratic movement that does exist, but they must keep a clean banner. He used to say, he used to repeat quite often, don't paint nationalism red. Don't try and give a communist coloring to national liberation struggles. You have to maintain class independence. And therefore you can't merge with any sort of uh, you know, national movements. You can't dissolve yourselves into any national movements. You've got to stand for an independent communist party. And in doing so, you've also got to combat any uh, reactionary trends within the national liberation struggle as well. Like for example, uh, you know, pan-Islamism was one that Lenin spoke about quite a bit which is obviously still relevant today as well, I would say. And uh, just as an aside, this is the direct opposite approach that the Stalinists took after Lenin's death. For example, in China in the 1920s, the Stalinists urged the Chinese communists to merge with the bourgeois nationalists, the Kuomintang, uh, and basically renounce all independence, basically. And actually, this led to the defeat of the 1927 Chinese Revolution, which I haven't got time to go into, but it is uh, very important. And the Stalinists believe, and they still do believe actually, that it is possible to solve the national question on a capitalist basis. For example, this is the Communist Party of Britain's position on Israel-Palestine to start with. It was their position in Ireland too during the 60s and 70s. Uh, and in fact, the 20th century is littered with examples of national movements and revolutions that have failed or were either aborted or crushed precisely because of the Stalinists' failure to take this uh, Lenin's advice into account. But on the other hand, the whole period of the colonial revolutions following the Second World War in particular reveals to us precisely the fact that the national question is intimately tied up with the need to break with capitalism. Across Asia and Africa in the post-war period, we saw countless movements to kick out imperialism and uh, you know, undergo a program of national regeneration essentially. And often owing to the lack of a Bolshevik style party to lead these struggles, the leadership of these movements often passed into the hands of, you know, sort of middle class intellectuals and in particular, actually, like military figures as well, like officers and, and, and so on. These leaders were not communists, right? They were merely setting out to remove imperialism and to set out upon, upon national regeneration. And yet, nonetheless, in the course of these struggles, they came up against the objective limitations of capitalism in the era of imperialism, which could not give these, in, these nations an independent existence. These leaders were therefore forced to expropriate the big companies, and to actually begin planning sections of the economy, albeit in a bureaucratic fashion, taking their inspiration, of course, like from the Soviet Union and from Maoist China as well. Some examples of this, I can only name a few, are uh, Nasser in Egypt, uh, Assad in, in Syria, the Derg in Ethiopia, which is also covered in the, in the magazine as well, uh, Gaddafi in Libya, Ben Bella in Algeria, uh, Cuba and China as well, I would say, also fall into this category, although in a bit of a different uh, way. Ted Grant discusses all of this, by the way, in an excellent article called The Colonial Revolutions and the uh, Deformed Workers' States. Uh, I'd recommend reading that, definitely. Now, these nations were not socialist by any means because the working class were not in control. We would categorize them as deformed workers' states, in fact, and all of them eventually went over to capitalism because of the limits of bureaucratic uh, planning. But nonetheless, these are all confirmations in a very distorted way, I would say, of the fact that the struggle against national oppression requires breaking with capitalism. And this is as true today as it was half a century ago, because all of these former colonial countries, whether they took the path of capitalism or not, have not resolved the national question whatsoever. They have not resolved the question of national oppression. Um, in fact, I would say they're more enslaved now than they were back then by the banks and the multinationals and the, uh, the international uh, market, the world market. We can see this today in events like uh, Kenya, for example, uh, and, and elsewhere. One last thing uh, worth drawing from Lenin's theses is that he had an insistence upon the slogan of federation as a means of solving the national question. And this is especially relevant to the former colonial countries where ethnic tensions have often been inflamed by decades of imperialist divide and rule. And of course, partition as well which often took place in a very arbitrary way. You know, look at the, uh, the Sykes-Picot line, which divides the, uh, the Middle East, which was, you know, arbitrarily divided by French and British imperialism, or in fact, the partition of India as well, which obviously played a very uh, bloody uh, role uh, in, in the 40s and, and in 50s. 
The fact is that not every nation state has had the luxury of centuries to form organically, like the likes of France and England and Germany and so on, which were, of course, ethnically homogenous as well. Often entire regions of the world consist of a patchwork of different languages and ethnicities and so on that are overlapping and are often impossible to therefore apportion into geographically contiguous states like the imperialists tried to do in the, uh, in, in the, in the 20th century. Now, Lenin's idea of federation strives to overcome this by uniting oppressed nationalities together into a voluntary unit, which can plan the economy together and maintain a relative degree of autonomy for the different national groups. The Soviets, for example, applied this principle in, um, to the nations in the Caucasus, in sort of like south of, uh, south of Russia, uh, places like Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, etc., which for centuries have been dogged by ethnic tensions uh, which were often artificially inflamed by the Tsar and by Tsarism. And yet, from 1922 to 1936, when these nations were united together in the Trans-Caucasian uh, Socialist Federation, they actually lived in relative peace and harmony, which we haven't really seen since, in fact. Obviously, tensions still existed, and uh, they were no doubt exacerbated by the oppression and the mismanagement of the Stalinist bureaucracy, uh, of course, you know, federation is not a silver bullet that removes all national uh, oppression instantly. But nonetheless, by pooling resources, resources together, by planning the economy collectively, while ensuring national autonomy, we can begin to undo uh, deeply held uh, national and ethnic divisions. Another example of this working very well, I would say, is the Yugoslav Federation as well. Again, for all of its faults, it was an undoubtedly progressive step to unite the different uh, nations of the Balkans into, into a single uh, unit, basically. And it provides a glimpse of what could be achieved with a genuine socialist federation. And I will say, of course, the, the basis for that working was the fact that in Yugoslavia, you often had 10% you know, GDP growth per year. People's living standards were going up and therefore national tensions declined. But of course, when the Stalinist bureaucracy failed to continue developing the productive forces, things started to fall apart again, which I think is quite an important uh, point. Now, this is precisely why we advanced the slogan, for example, of a socialist federation of Palestine and the Middle East, a socialist federation of, of South Asia as well, as well as many other examples that we can give. This is a central part of our program on the national question, the idea that actually, in order for the national question to be resolved, we need to break past the barriers of the capitalist nation state and plan the economy collectively. Now, the last thing I want to touch upon is the question of, uh, you know, national movements in the modern day. As I mentioned earlier, the crisis of capitalism has thrown up a number of national questions which were once thought to be solved. In some places, these are plain reactionary and divisive, like uh, you know, the Flemish and Wallonian national uh, movements in Belgium. In other cases, they're a bit more complex, like for example, uh, with Quebec, which has a left-wing strand and a white right-wing strand. In each case, they have to be weighed concretely. Of course, the national question in Belgium is gonna be very different to the national question in, for example, Palestine, right? They're completely different countries. Um, but I think one example of a resurgent national question, which is very instructive actually, is Scotland, because it typifies how resentment against capitalism and an absence of a revolutionary leadership can actually lead to consciousness moving along national lines. Because the national question in Scotland had been resolved for, for centuries, in fact. And in the 80s and 90s, the SNP was seen as a bit of a joke, actually. They were on the fringes of politics. They were also quite right-wing as well. They were often referred to as the Tartan Tories. Um, and Scotland used to be a Labour Party stronghold as well. However, the attacks and counter-reforms of the, of the Blair years meant that support for Labour dwindled. There was lots of anger and resentment against Labour. And in the 2010s, the SNP decided to capitalise upon this growing left-wing mood and begin attacking the whole of Westminster, the Labour Party and the Tories, uh, for their austerity politics. And this appealed to the tens of thousands of uh, workers and young people who were fed up with the system. And this actually sparked a very vibrant pro-independence movement which took on a life of its own. The point is that this national movement took on a progressive character because in the eyes of thousands of people, it was aimed precisely against the establishment and ultimately actually against the capitalist system, even if they weren't aware of it at the time. And actually we see that every mass national movement, like all mass movements in fact, have a tendency to split along class lines at some point. This reminds me actually of a phrase used by Leon Trotsky in the history of the Russian Revolution where he says that the national question can often be the shell of an immature Bolshevism. And what this means is that national aspirations can often have, especially in the modern day, a socialistic content. And then it's the job of communists to skillfully intervene in such movements where it's appropriate to link this desire for change, for fundamental change, to an internationalist communist program. And that is exactly what we did 
in uh, Scotland. We you know, stood for a, a socialist workers' republic and world socialist revolution. This is also, of course, very similar to the Basque and, and Catalan uh, national questions as well, which I haven't really got time to go into, but I'm sure there'd be a chance for that in the discussion. Uh, and also, I think, a similar process is beginning to unfold, perhaps in Wales as well, actually, where Plaid Cymru are now actually neck and neck with, uh, with the Labour Party, who, of course, have completely discredited themselves after years of austerity and corruption, uh, etc. Of course, this is a struggle of living forces. And if we, as the RCP and the Revolutionary Communist International, are able to grow quickly enough, we can become a, a factor in the situation, and we can begin to channel uh, consciousness in a communist direction rather than a nationalist one. That is ultimately up for us to decide, I think, to a certain degree. I think this should all remind us, and I want to end on this point, that the national question, as Lenin said, is fundamentally a question of bread, not a question of, of culture or even of political democracy for that matter. It's a question of who controls the resources in society. Now, there are more examples that I'd like to go into. Uh, that's exactly what the discussion is for, I guess. But hopefully I've given a good introduction to the Leninist method uh, uh, in terms of approaching the national question. But as with the rest of the Marxist method, we can't use these, uh, the, um, this as a sort of a set of rigid formulas or criteria, for example. We need to study the living, breathing movements that are taking place all around us, not as passive observers, but actually as active participants, as partisans of world socialist revolution. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks.